Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Pan and we're coming to you live from Davos. The headliner joining us this morning, Bill Gates. Bill, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here in Davos. The focus and the attention is on AI, but I know you want the world to focus its attention and its bandwidth on what's happening as far as attaining the healthcare goals are concerned. And you're concerned that we're slipping and that funding is an issue and a big challenge. That's right. Um, you know, making sure pe kids survive, uh, making sure they're well nourished. Uh, there's been a lot of progress since the turn of the century, but with all of the unrest, you know, the pandemic, uh, we've lost attention to that, and so we need to go back and uh, keep reducing these deaths. We went down from 10 million to 5 million, and we can cut it in half again. Uh, India's a place that is making progress. We've got a lot of great partners there, but we need to get these new innovative tools out helping the patients. So the silver lining is what's happening on the innovation side, and you spoke about the innovative tools. I have one in my hand, so we're going to get Bill to talk to us about this in just a second. But that's the plus side, uh, but you do require funding to be able to get these tools out there in the market and to be able to get people to access them, and that's the concern. Uh, that the Gates Foundation is doubling down on funding because we're seeing a decline as far as developmental aid is concerned. What's your message to governments, to policymakers, to global business leaders today? Well, we should, the rich countries should be more generous in their aid budgets uh, so that we can support whatever uh, unrest demands, uh, whatever climate demands, and continue uh, to have more resources for health. Uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines helps buy vaccines. Uh, that's based on the rich countries and Gates Foundation generosity. And we're trying to make sure that uh, as we go back uh, to replenish that fund, uh, that we can raise as much as we did in the past because it's had such an, an incredible impact. Do you believe you're going to be able to raise the kind of money that we raised in the past? Or do you think that the macroeconomic headwinds and challenges, uh, you know, with the war and the uh, uncertainty that the world is dealing with, is going to be tough for you to be able to do that? Yeah, the money going into particularly African countries with interest rates up, new loans are down, you know, aid is pretty flat and a lot of it's going to new activities. Uh, we're going to have to economize somewhat, but uh, this is the most important work going on in the world, uh, saving literally millions of lives. Uh, India is making progress. We pilot a lot of these new ideas there uh, and then scale them up uh, to the entire world. So talk to me about some of the pilots that are underway in India and what gives you hope and confidence of being able to take them up to scale? Well, one tool that the one you've got in I'm hand I'm there, this is pretty incredible because it brings together uh, AI with health. Uh, this is the scanner uh, that you can use. So when a woman's pregnant, you scan them and you can tell is the delivery going to be difficult or not. And based on that, uh, the woman needs to go where she can get a C-section or she can have the confidence to stay uh, and just have the, uh, the local uh, health care workers or midwives. And so with this diagnosis, which is actually very, very cheap, uh, you can reduce maternal deaths uh, by about 50%. It's a new thing. Uh, it's under the, the pilots are underway in India right now. You know, we're talking with the regulator about what they'd, they'd like to see working with partners. But a uh, perfect example of how you can bring something cheap, AI-enabled, uh, so that you don't need an expensive technician, the software is doing the hard work. Hmm. So let's talk about what AI could do potentially as far as the healthcare system is concerned in countries like India. Where do you see AI coming in to bridge some of the deficits that currently exist? Well, AI will be beneficial in two ways. It'll accelerate the invention of new tools, new vaccines, new drugs. Uh, the, the rate of innovation will be much faster. <clears throat> But also, the patients themselves, when they're concerned about their health, uh, they'll be able to consult directly. And the workers in the healthcare system, they'll be getting advice and being trained. For example, we'll use AI training where you can ask, the worker can ask any questions. And so the cost of training, the quality of training will be much better because it'll have AI embedded. But does it address the shortages that we see as far as healthcare workers are concerned? Not just in India, but globally, that's a huge challenge. And how, how will it help bridge that gap? No, it helps dramatically. You know, for the doctor, it's helping with the paperwork. Uh, 
you know, for the nurse, it's helping them think through, okay, what the different things are. Uh, even for the patient to get answers directly. So in some cases, they don't need to actually go in and be at the health center. Uh, you know, it makes the whole health system far more effective. Chad GPT, you know, what do you make of uh, the breakout moment that we've seen for Chad GPT and the implications and the impact it's going to have on the global economy? Well, this is a huge milestone because AIs up until now could recognize images, uh, could recognize speech, but they couldn't read and write. And so Chad GPT 4, uh, and now many competitors are doing similar things, it's the first time the AI uh, can actually scan a complex document and summarize it for you. It can go find information for you. It can help you rewrite things. It can help a student prompt them as they're uh, trying to improve their writing skills. So for all white collar work, for students, uh, for the health system, this is really a, an aid uh, that even in a five year time period, we'll see immense productivity increases. So how would you qualify this moment in technology? I mean, given the experience that you've had, the many changes that we've seen, do you believe that this is perhaps one of the most profound uh, technological advances that we've seen? Yeah, the progress uh, will be fast. Uh, part of the beauty of it is you can take the low-cost cell phone and the mobile network you've already got. The patient doesn't have to buy new hardware. There has to be a computer running the AI, and okay, we have to make that cheap and have a lot of that. But uh, the cell network you have today, the cell phone you have today, that's the infrastructure used to do these AI-enabled consultations. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about vaccines because through the pandemic, the work that you did with Serum, et cetera, uh, you know, helped bridge some of the shortages that existed, at least for countries like ours in India. But as we now look at vaccine manufacturing coming up in different parts of the world, you know, how do you see this playing out, this vaccine supply chain diversification and what its impact could be? Well, India is uh, the volume leader by far uh, with vaccines, you know, starting with serum, but also people like BioE, Barat. Uh, and it's fantastic how they responded during the pandemic, worked with the government, uh, made a lot of vaccines. The Gates Foundation provided some support as well. We make sure that for all these vaccines, uh, that there's enough capacity, uh, that there's competition, so the prices keep going down. And we will have new vaccines. We'll have a, a TB vaccine, malaria vaccine, HIV vaccine, and even the things like COVID vaccines, we need to make them have longer duration, more coverage, uh, and we're gonna change, instead of using the needle to use a little patch. Uh, so the pandemic really highlighted that we've been underinvested in those innovations and it, you know, our partners in India are, are part of how we're gonna uh, get these breakthrough products done. This is your disappointment and frustration, isn't it, Bill, that you know, while climate continues to be a big challenge and a crisis, we now have the COP addressing some of those challenges, but for health, uh, you, know, you, you need something similar? Well, the visibility of health, uh, which is, you know, should be at the top of the list of how we affect people's lives, solving nutrition, uh, solving maternal deaths. Uh, it, it isn't getting uh, the visibility, and yet, you know, why are we worried about climate? We're worried because you'll have malaria in more places, you'll have more floods, and you know, in Pakistan, for example, they had a lot of malaria after their floods and uh, thousands of deaths that came out of that. So, uh, you know, more money is going into the health system in India, uh, you know, increasing that even faster uh, but using these innovative tools, it's going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. What is uh, exciting to you in India outside of what's happening on the healthcare side? I know you've been an advocate of what's happened with Aadhaar and of course the digital public stack as well. As you look at the digital story and how it's playing out in India with Aadhaar, with UPI, etc., what's uh, what are you most excited about? Well, India did a great job of using the G20 meeting to highlight the great work they've done. Uh, you know, the foundation's been a partner in that. Uh, people like Donna and Neil and Connie uh, have, have been involved in that. And it's really for financial transactions and in the future for things like health and education made things more efficient, you know, avoided middlemen uh, having to be paid. And so uh, India rightly uh, wants to share this example and actually help uh, 
all the countries in the world uh, build these digital systems. We have some universities in India uh, that have been staffed up uh, for these projects. And so, you know, I look at a map of Africa and say, okay, which countries have adopted this stack uh, and how can we help really uh, make sure that things like digital finance are available to everyone. Uh, we've got elections in many countries, including the U.S. and, of course, India as well. Uh, from a healthcare <coughs> and a development aid perspective, how important will 2024 be and the electoral outcomes could shape the way that funding works? Yeah, I, I hope, you know, in democracies, you'd like to have two politicians competing for, you know, I'm going to run the health system better, you know, I'll run the health system That's better. <laughs> no, I'd say in India over time, no, India. the degree that, that, that kind of competence for key systems has been one of the issues actually, I think, has been positive. In the U.S., um, you know, we've had leaders, including Republican leaders, who've been great on global health. Uh, there's a lot of priorities. Uh, I'm hoping whoever gets elected will maintain uh, the U.S. generosity on the research side and even on delivery funding because uh, particularly in areas like HIV, it's made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you look at the, the outlook for 2024, uh, we continue to see an uncertain world. What worries you the most at this point in time? Debt uh, continues to be a concern for large parts of the economy. Uh, global economy slowing down is, of course, a challenge as well. What worries you the most and where do you find your optimism? Well, human innovation uh, will allow us uh, to improve lives dramatically. The financial headwinds are tough. Uh, whenever you get war, that's, of course, an incredible tragedy. You know, that takes us backwards. Uh, and so that balance of continuing the innovation, make sure it gets delivered, even in the face of these challenges, uh, you know, that's what gets me excited and working with others uh, to show this positive progress. You know, when we're talking about innovation and working with others, I have to ask you about regulation. A lot of uh, chat around what kind of regulation we should have around AI, uh, what should be regulated, who should regulate, whether there can be a global compact on regulating. How do you see AI regulation and, and the need for it and what it should regulate? Well, it's a lot like the internet where your current laws about financial fraud or uh, copyright, things like that, will apply here as well. It will make it easier to generate misinformation, and so you really have to look at the rules there and make sure that uh, the, that negative's not outweighing the positives. Uh, you've got to, you want to make sure it's available in the healthcare system, but that it's accurate enough uh, that there's uh, nothing negative about that. These are very early days. What's good is the politicians want to learn, want to see where it can benefit them. And, you know, politicians all over the world will talk about how do you get the good stuff to be fast and minimize uh, uh, the misinformation piece. But do you believe that we need to slow down the innovation? Is that even possible till the regulation catches up? I haven't really heard anyone saying uh, that they think we should slow down. Uh, you know, that could be open for debate uh, but I still see uh, deploying it in areas like health and education as something we should encourage. You want to make sure the good guys have AI so that for cyber defense or, you know, detecting, uh, you know, misinformation. And so, so far, you know, empowering uh, good things, uh, you know, justifies going full speed ahead. Which is the use case that you're most excited about when we talk about the transformative power of AI, inclusive and responsible AI? Well, the two that are dramatic are health, both for creating new tools and uh, for helping patients uh, seek health care in a, a smart way, and then education, where you can have an individual tutor uh, that helps you learn new things. I want to talk to you about gender parity as well as what the foundation is doing on being able to focus on women's health in specific. Uh, and Again, this is one of those things that doesn't get enough attention, continues to be hugely underinvested. Are you starting to see at least an acknowledgement of something that needs to be done to fix this? Well, the majority of our health R&D focuses on these issues, like uh, women who die during pregnancy. It's an incredible tragedy. Uh, we have new tools uh, that reduce uh, the bleeding problem. 
very dramatically. Uh, you have blood pressure, which is eclampsia. You have infection. In every one of those areas, we're the biggest funder of, uh, of low-cost tools yeah. uh, that can be load, uh, rolled out. Uh, you know, we've got on-the-ground partnerships in places like UP and Bihar where these things are being tried out. You know, we hear what works. Um, so, yes, it, it's an area that needs more funding. So, speaking of funding, the Gates Foundation has committed $8.5 billion in 2024, uh, but a lot more money is required to be put on the table. What's the message to, uh, to those who have large pockets uh, and can put good money to good use? Well, philanthropy is a growing thing, including in India. And, uh, you know, we have people there who are looking at uh, areas like health. You know, we're excited to be working with them. Uh, you know, you should have a high expectation that philanthropists help out those uh, most in need, and it can grow a lot. What's the one big risk that you're most concerned about today as you look at the world? Uh, well, the instability. Uh, you know, that includes things like U.S.-China relations, uh, that could slow down all this progress. And uh, so hopefully you get reasonable uh, works on both sides. And, you know, India can play a role there. What role do you believe India can play there? Well, India's, you know, setting an example. Uh, India works both with China and the United States. Uh, and we saw at the G20, it was very constructive to, to turn the attention to win-win relationships. Bill Gates, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here in Davos on CNBC TV. Tina, appreciate your time. Thank you.